everybody welcome to another episode another episode of the lit rpg podcast i am ramon Mejia. i'm here to bring you the latest little news reviews and of course author interviews and this week is episode number 106 of the show so thank you very much for hanging out with us and this week i have seven new lit rpg reviews just for you folks at home of course uh, i want to be, give a quick shout out to a couple of new supporters of the podcast who are helping to make this uh, podcast possible every single week for you folks at home without ads without any kind of um a uh, uh, self-funding it basically a big shout out to gabriel rathwig and sean callahan who are two new supporters of the show uh they both made donations to the podcast they helped again keep it uh free and well funded uh and gabriel made a one-time donation via paypal and sean became a regular supporter on patreon uh and i just want to thank you both from the bottom of my heart uh thank you for your support again without folks like you uh this show would not be possible so thank you very much um if you two at home want to be a supporter of the show if you like what we do and want to help keep this thing going um you can find all the ways to help support the podcast at litrpgpodcast.com slash support so thank you very much okay uh on to we have uh, these are the seven new reviews that i'll be uh, going over this week with your folks, uh, and including uh, Rescue, the Stroke Tower book number four. Uh, after that, it'll be the Arcane Transmogrification. Uh, and the rest of the title is book two of the Pentacle series. Uh, then it's going to be Viridian Gate Online. This is the fifth book in the series. It's titled The Lich Priest. After that, it will be Shard Warrior, a little bit of novel, Crystal Shards Online, book number two. After that, it'll be Alpha Testing. Uh, Angrami Angramoria, Little RPG Adventure. Uh, then after that will be Betrayal, a Little RPG Adventure, Monsters, Maces, and Magic, book number two, and then a Gamer's Wish, uh, a Game Lit series, Hidden Wishes, book number one. So there you go. Uh, but of course, we begin our show though with Little RPG News. Only there's no Little RPG News. Uh, sorry, there's just been a slow news week in the Little community. Nothing really super exciting or amazing or tragic, thankfully, has happened recently. Um, so um, there's really no news section at this point. Uh, but we do have a few titles out that are out now that I haven't had a chance to review or read. Uh, and that does include uh, Killing Time. Um, this is the Realms book number 1.5, a humorously epic epic little bg adventure this is kind of a middle story between the first book and the second book that tells kind of a side uh, 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 another character's point of view in this little bg world that's not the main character in this series so there you go um then there's going to be uh, also desire a little bit adventure volume number one is also out right now as is reconfigure uh dungeon configuration which is a two different titles uh, the one that's on the cover and the one that's actually on the Amazon listing. So there you go. Uh, and also out right now is Into the Black. Uh, written by Stuart Gross. This is book number nine in the series, Battle for Earth. That is out as well, as is uh, Xavier P. Hunter's new little story called Homebrew. Uh, I actually had to f- go out and look specifically for a few of these titles because they weren't showing up on my Amazon listing uh, when I do like a general search for Little BD. Um, so thankfully found a few new ones that I even, I, I didn't ha- happen to notice. So there you go. And that's going to be Homebrew, a Little BD novel, Metagamer Chronicles book number one that is out now. It actually came out, a, I think, a couple weeks ago. So there you go. Okay, now there is only one new Little BD audiobook as far as I'm aware. Um, that's the Dungeons, Burden, Slime Dungeon Chronicles book number four is out as an audiobook. Now you may have had a hard time finding it. Um, because it is oddly enough listed not under general sci-fi and fantasy, uh, which is where I look for most Little BD audiobooks, but apparently it's listed under children's book on Audible. Um, what about this cover with the kind of creepy girl with the sc- skull in her arms with the glowing red eyes says children's book to Audible? I don't know, but that's where it's listed currently, but hopefully they'll be making corrections soon uh, to that particular listing because it was a little hard to find. 
Okay, now up next is the upcoming Little Beauty titles that I know about. This is just a list of titles. There are a few new additions to this list, though, but you can, of course, skip ahead to the regular reviews if you wish to. Uh, but out on April 7th, only a couple days from now, is going to be Critical Failures book number six. That's right, book number six in this series is out. Um, it's it's going. Uh, Robert Bevan had pleasure to meet the gentleman at Dragon Con 2017 last year. Really nice guy. Always support his work. Uh, super hilarious stuff, but it is very potty humorish. Um, sex jokes galore, you know, foul language. Uh, so it is for adults, but it is very funny. It's one of the funniest um, little RPG titles that I've ever read. But uh, of course, it is according to your particular taste in humor. But it is getting the sixth book in that series is out on April the seventh. Uh, on April the tenth, it's rather it'll be Absalon's fate. A little bit of quest uh, on the 13th of April, the Hobgoblin Riot, which is Dominions of Blades, book number two. That one will be out at that point. Um, this one is new to the list on April the 17th. It'll be the Mist of Arantia, Realm of Archon, book number seven will be out on that series. So looking forward to that. Um, April 23rd, Countdown, Rally Banners, book number one. Uh, April the 24th, World and Steel. Uh, that's going to be Feral, book number nine. Um, short story collection from the good folks at Magic Dome Books is going to be Urine Game, book number two, out on April the 30th. Um, on the May to the 10th, 10th rather, it'll be Mightier Still. Um, and then on May the 10th, it'll be, it'll also be Blind Gambit, a game lit, lit RPG novel. Uh, looking forward to seeing which one it is or both. I don't know. Uh, on May the 17th, it'll be World of Karnak, book number two. On May the 24th, it'll be God Mode, which is Alter Game, book number three. Uh, on May 27th, Kingdom Level 5 will be out. On May 28th, it'll be Trial by Fire, which is uh, the second book in the Arkemi Online Chronicles uh, series. On May the 30th, it'll be The Dead Rogue. This is, again, a new book from uh, a different Russian author. So um, it'll be fun to see something new. Um and there you go. That's it. That's all the stuff that I know that's coming out. And again, folks, if at home, if you have a little bit of title coming out that is not uh, of a pre-order, but you still want people to know about it, um, send me a message. I'll be more than happy to to do an early read on that or, or to just put up information about it uh, as long as it actually is Lit RPG. That is, of course, a good qualifier because this is the Little RPG podcast. And so that's, that's what I review here. So uh, for free, some information you have on things you know that, that aren't on this list or things that you find maybe uh, that I happen to miss for some reason, either upcoming or that have just come out, you can always send that information to uh, um, feedback at geekbypodcast.com. Again, that's feedback at geekbypodcast.com or libertypodcast at gmail.com. Either one of those emails will get the information right to us. You can also, of course, message us on Facebook or Twitter. Okay, on to new releases and reviews. And in new releases and reviews, we're going to begin our first review with Rescue the Stork Tower, book number four, written by Tony Corden. So there we go. Uh, this one is about 400 pages. Um, currently on Amazon, there is no official page count, but that's what I'm estimating as. It is $4.49. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. So always a good time on Kindle Unlimited there. Um, and I'll read you the author's description. You know, I, I won't because I, I realized I just remembered that the author's description is actually a, a summary of the premise, which is a simple area leaves Leah with unique neural enhancement chips and rapidly evolving AI implant in her brain. In Nason, she evaded kidnapping by virtual slavers and helped shut down some operations in the virtual crime syndicate that uses mind control players as slaves. And then it gives you a little summary for each of the other books in the series. So you have one for uh, Nason, one for Odyssey, Change, and Rescue. Uh, and this would go to the book, fourth book in the series. So you can go read that. But uh, essentially the premise is that this girl, Leah, um, in her world, in the future, everyone is afforded um, a basic chip enhancement. Um, and for some reason, there's a mix up and she gets an enhanced model. And her AI that's developed there is better than everyone else's. And it actually has some very unique and interesting abilities, which is part of the storyline, which I won't spoil. Um, but regardless, she lives in a kind of... Um, the slums or the hood in her area. I think she lives in Australia. Uh, and it is a very interesting story that combines her trying to make a living in the virtual world, finding enemies and people who are opposing her and kind of stumbling into like these big, massive secret things and some secret information that people want. And also um, making an impact on the real world in her community using the fact that she can transfer resources or store resources from the game worlds that she plays to real world money. 
Uh, and there's a bunch of like serious plot ends, which I, it'll take me an hour to summarize. <laughs> I'm going to summarize all four series, but that's kind of the core of the story. Um, in Okay, so if my review of the story at this point, um, this is a good addition to the series. Um, if you've liked the other novels in this series, this is not going to disappoint. It's a good it's a good addition. Um, it has all the action, adventure, intrigue, RPG, gameplay, sci-fi, AI stuff that you've loved come to enjoy about the series by this point. Uh, and this is kind of the case when whenever I start reviewing uh, like book two, three, four, five, six, seven in the series. If you uh, if you're into the series by this point, you probably already figured out whether you like it or not. And most of my reviews are about oh something changes that it might change your opinion of it, or it continues on in a good in a good way. And this definitely does continue on. Um, the real life storyline in this novel is kicked up a notch. Um, in this one, Leah's family member is kidnapped, and her and her expanding crew of of teammates and and employees has to decide how to find her mom and if they're going to give the into the kidnappers' demands. There's also advancement on several other storylines, including possible traitors to her group and the main character schooling, uh, which is a whole storyline in itself. Um, there are also in-game advancements um, in this particular world. It's a hub universe, which means there are there's a central like starting location for each character, their own world or their home they can create, um, and from there they can go into different game worlds. Um, in the previous entries in the series, we had um, two different worlds. We had a fantasy world and we had a sci-fi world. They have particular names. I don't even remember them. I just call them fantasy world and sci-fi world. Um, and that was it. In this particular novel, that ex- um, those expand. There are now a total of four game worlds that the main character um, is going to be having storylines and having adventures, things to do, including um, a new one, which is a ruined discovery game. And then there's also a steampunk world. Uh, um, and the steampunk world definitely has the most time in the novel next to the fantasy world. Um, one of the things I always like about the series is just kind of its its commitment to the main character's um, attributes. She's always opposing bullets. That was very clear from the very first novel, and it's it's only increased in this in the series as she was confronted by bigger and bigger entities who want to try to push her around. Um, and I always find it so hilarious in this novel when the main character uses her enhanced. Um, abilities, I guess, her man's mind capabilities and her AI to, um, and her understanding of contracts and logic processes to kind of push back against big entities that are kind of scary, like crime lords, academic institutes, the media, and even big corporations, including the game company. Um, and it's kind of an extension of like bad faith actions in earlier books, kind of having consequences here. And it's a really good follow through by the author, because that takes some planning, to be honest. Like if you were going to start like showing consequences in book three or four, but they start in a book one that, that takes a little bit of planning. So good on the author for, for doing that. Um, the only thing I really didn't like about this particular story was the steampunk stuff. It's just not my thing. I know there are plenty of people who are on both sides of that. They love steampunk. Uh, they don't. I'm all, I, I like steampunk's um, inventiveness and the gadgetry kind of stuff. I'm just not a big fan of like the Victorian era stuff. I'm like, eh, it's okay. Um, additionally, uh, the novel's, are continuing to be getting get, getting more and more busy. And what I mean by that is that there are there are no cooldown periods. There are no lulls in the story. Almost every minute, um, in every chapter, the main character is doing something to advance one of like the dozen or more storylines in the novel. I mean, there are things with her boyfriend, with her friends, with the virtual world, with her academic life, with her family and the world world, with the community in the world world, um, with like various entities who are all in opposition to her. Uh, there's a bunch, there are multiple storylines in each one of those game rules. So there's a lot of like things in these novels that have, that are, are being advanced um, on a continuous basis. And that anxious pacing may actually turn off some people uh, just because it's, it is so busy. Um, but again, by book four, you've kind of already figured out whether that works for you or not. Um, overall, like the story, I stayed up way too late in the night uh, to finish this one in, in a single reading, but I always have a good time with the series. Again, um, the first book in this series is a little harder to get into. It does pick up in book two if you're considering to try to start it out. Book one, again, is probably the hardest of them to to get into. And you can read our review at littlebitpodcast.com. Um, in a review section for this particular series, if you want to see why on all those explanations for all the other stories, um, to see if it's something you want to check out. But again, overall, I've had a really good time with it so far. This one gets a score of 7 out of 10. That's Rescue the Stork Tower, book number four, with a score of 7 out of 10. There we go. On to our next review, uh, Arcane Transmogrification, the book two in the Pentacle series.
There we go. Um, this one is 402 pages, $4.99. It is not available on Kindle Unlimited. So it's a, it's a not my purchase, but uh, per page count, um, the price is pretty well, pretty well set. Okay, this is the author's description. Danny died less than a heroic death on Earth, was reincarnated in a new world and gained access to a mental sanctuary that ranks his skills, learned learned he can do magic, discovered that he can't fly, tricked old rich ladies into buying handbags, crafted himself a crude anti-magic girdle, went to magic school, grew a couple of apple trees, and was drafted into a secret paramilitary organization, tamed a pet that most people would rather never meet, regrew an elf's ears, gained a split concentration ability in his former Earth self, avoided being kidnapped, and was almost eaten by basilisks, watched an airborne wizard play whack troll, saved his friends from massive ritualistic magic spells, and did a great impression of a human tree ornament. Then, Danny passed out from his blood loss. Now it's all up to Cranny, the embodiment of Danny's split concentration, to get Danny fixed up before the slowly approaching zombie goblin uh, has a nice, wonderful picnic. There you go. That's actually where the novel's starting out. Right after that point. Um, this is a good second book in this series. Um, it's Slice of Life, reincarnated in the game world. Um, it's moved past all the Magical Academy stuff from book number one. And it instead focuses on Danny's training with his new elemental aspects and his effort to help um, the elves with their magical problems. And if you can help them, they'll help the humans fight off this invading goblin army. Um, if you like book one in the series, you'll like book two. Again, this is one of those things. There's a lot of DBC style training and transformation. So if you've ever seen like Dragon Ball Z, um, where it's like train, 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 do different but things and then power up and go beat the bad guys. That's kind of what a lot of this is. But it's, I mean, it's, that's oversimplification. There's a ton of like cool little plots and storylines. Um, it still maintains the RPG aspects of progression with that inner sanctum where uh, the main character can see how he's doing and ranking up and learning kind of these new abilities and skills from it. Um, the harem stuff in this novel is still here too. So if you're into that, um, it's not like super sexual though. Um, so it's, it's one of those like, oh, he kind of has a bunch of girlfriends that he doesn't do anything with. Uh, so it is that kind of harem. It's, it's relatively tame. Uh, but again, um, a lot of the story isn't action focused until the last act of the novel, which like the last um, 20, 25 percent of the story. A lot of the there's there's still some action scenes, but they're um, a lot fewer. Like the first 10 percent is like I said, maybe 10, 15 percent is action. The rest of it is training, different storylines with the elves, um, magical studies and a bunch of other things, which are interesting, just not action. Uh, so just be aware of that. Overall, I think time of the story. Um, I'll admit, though, book two is not the place to start off in this series. It gives very few explanations. There's a bunch of stuff as far as um, explaining how the RPG progression system goes that is not uh, reviewed or covered at all uh, so you really do have to read book one in the series before you read book two so other than that um, again good time had a good time with it gets a score of seven out of ten that's arcane transmog glorification book two in the pentacle series with a score of seven out of ten there you go <laughs> Okay, uh, next review, Viridian Gate Online, The Lich Priest, a little bit of adventure, the Viridian Gate Archives, book number five. I think, he, I feel like um, um, J. Hunter changed the title a little bit to Viridian Gate Archives, because it encompasses a lot of other, like, not just the main video series anymore, so there you go, just weird commentary for me. Uh, okay, this one is 289 pages. It is $4.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. I will read you the author's description. The Vorgath Horde has come, and they bring real death with them. Not even players are safe from the power of the malware blades. Worse, the realm of order, dominion of the overmind Sophia, is in danger. Slowly being corrupted by an ancient evil, the Lich Priest. And if he is successful, it could mean the end of Sophia and the downfall of the Crimson Alliance. Grim Jack never thought he'd find himself siding with the Empire. But now that his terrible new threat has arrived, making friends of old enemies may be the only way to survive. Bum, bum, boom. It's actually, uh, it's a very interesting story. Full disclosure, though, um, I received an advanced copy for review from the author. I went out and purchased the thing when it came out because I enjoyed it. I had a good time. And I always want to support um, the authors that you know, stuff I enjoy. Um, okay, so um, if you've been following this series, you probably know whether you're going to like it or not. And this one is a good addition to it. Um, Grimjack and Osmark, who in the first 
everything before this, basically, uh, were enemies. And Oswald was a big bad guy. And now they're ostensibly allies, but they still don't trust each other. And so the two, along with a small team of allies, are transported to the plane of order in order to help the goddess of order, Sophia. You know, so that's kind of thrilling. Um, and even though this part of uh, this story is basically still part of the official video series, um, it's not technically a side story. It kind of feels like it is. And that's mostly because of the way that it's set up. Um, all the adventurers, the main character, Osmark, the other um, secondary character in the story, they're all kind of whisked away from the regular game world. And they're sent to this like pocket universe, the, the, the plane of order. Um, and nothing that really happens there impacts the larger war or the main storyline. Like, yeah, there are some really good character arcs. So there are some good battles. There's a bunch of like, maybe some, there's some new loot that's going to be coming into play in the main storyline. Um, but for most of it, it's, it's kind of just a series of captured the flag, like raid battles. And that's not bad. It's just, it's, it's, it's entertaining. It is, uh, it just doesn't really have an impactful meaning to advancing the main storyline. And that, that for, for some people, that's going to be great. Some For some people, that's not going to be great. Some people really have an issue with like um, getting a book and feeling, like, oh, this didn't accomplish anything um, as far as like advancing the main plot line. Um, and other people are like, oh, like me, like I had a good time with it. I think it's a great side story. Um, but at the same time, if I'm honest, I'm like, oh, you could probably skip this. Like if it went from book four and then to six, I don't think you miss like a ton of like stuff that was super important to the storyline. But at the same time, it's a fun story. It's entertaining. There's good action. There's good adventure. Um, all the things you like about the series are here. Um, and it, it could, but it just kind of feels like a bottle episode of a TV series. It's fun, interesting, but also something you can skip if you don't have the money for it. Or if like you have something else, you just have to read and you can come back to this later. Um, so that's kind of it. Enjoyable story. Had a good time with it personally. Um, but again, it just kind of felt that way to me at least. But again, if you enjoy the series, you're going to enjoy the story. Um, gets a score of 7 out of 10. That's going to be Rooting Gate Online, The Lich Priest, A Little Bit Adventure, The Rooting Gate Archives, book number 5. Such long titles. Uh, with the score of 7 out of 10. So it is a good read. Okay, on to Shard Warrior, A Little Bit Novel, Crystal Shards, book on um, Crystal Shards Online, book number 2. Um, written by Rick Scott. So there you go. Um, you might remember book one, the Dodge Tank. This is the second book in that series. Okay, it is 364 pages, $4.99. It is available on Kindle Limited, and I'm going to read you the author's description. Um, becoming a Dodge Tank was just the beginning. The world boss is defeated, but Ryan's troubles are far from over. Transported to a new world, Ryan and his friends must figure out how to save their home city of Citadel while learning to survive in a game world where death is now all too real. But first, Ryan must keep his promise to Valhalla and sets out on a dangerous quest to the Vale of Sorrows to defeat the Shadow King. With an enemy ten times stronger than a world boss, Ryan will have to do some serious leveling up as a dodge tank to be fit to for the task. When Ryan encounters a fellow gamer with an agenda of his own, Ryan finds his plans not only derail, but is very life-threatened by an enemy of his own making. Ryan will have to grow in both level and maturity to face the difficult struggles ahead, but the game has more secrets to reveal, and the enemies lying just below the surface may be more terrifying than anything he could have imagined. So there you go. Okay. Um, at the end of book one, the main character, Ryan, he helps be the world, but that's the beginning there. Um, he and the winning group, again, this is going to be slightly spoilery. There's no way around it. So if you, if, if you just want another review, uh, it gets score seven and 10 good time. Uh, all the kinds of, so a, a lot of this review, even like the, the novel's description is a little spoilery for book number one, if you haven't read it. So heads up. Okay, uh, at the end of book one, the main character, Ryan, he defeated the real boss, and him and his group were transported to the real world as their avatars. So they saw their game powers, and in, in this particular series, the larger world has been um, taken over by nanites and AIs. So the service world is kind of uninhabitable for regular people. And so in this this universe, in this particular entry in the series, they're they can go there as their avatars, but it, it comes at a, at a particular nanite cost to the city. And so very few people do. And so part of that storyline was that, oh, that whole game in book one was kind of a test to see who was good enough 
to go and trying to go in the outside world to get the resources that the Citadel needs to actually survive. So good storyline. Really enjoyed it. Um, here, there's also a secondary storyline um, that Valhalla, she wants to rescue her friend who's trapped in Lazarus. Again, that's part of the novel description. Not spoiling anything there. Um, but those are the two kind of partially um, conflicting goals because there are multiple characters in this particular group who have different uh, things they want to do and they all feel that they, they know how best to do them. Of course, there's also uh, family struggles and, and friend struggles and a bunch of other like um, interpersonal relationships. So all good stuff there. Uh, however, most of the story is just good action. It's a good action story with minor elements of town building. Um, after the group rescues, um, um, escapes the powerful monsters at the beginning, uh, they go and save a town who's just full of NPCs. But in saving the town, the main character can claim ownership of it and becomes like this miniature like town building thing where you can take resources, gather new resources, and get nanites to help them build things. I thought it was going to be a, a bigger part of the story. Turns out it's not. Um, it could just be something that the author was kind of exploring, um, or it could be something that he plans to develop in the future. But it does also set up the 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 antagonist in the story, who kind of has a similar bit, only he's been doing it longer. So it's a nice little kind of pairing between the two two characters of the main character and this new antagonist. That's a little late in the story. Um, so good stuff, but it's also a nice break from like action. So good things there. Um, the best part of the story that I liked was definitely the twisty section where the group meets another player who again has made a place for himself in the above ground world. I won't explain how because it's it's interesting all on its own. Um, now, the only thing I don't really like about the story is definitely going to be the ending. Um, it feels like it comes out of left field a little bit, but even though it hits like an emotional note, um, it again, it just feels like that doesn't quite make sense, but I get why the author does it because he wants to hook them in for the next book, but still, it kind of annoyed me. Um, overall, though, good time reading it. I don't like the story quite as much as book one just because... Um, it's harder for the main character or his group to fail when failure means death. And so um, it, it's more cha it's more challenging to to see them learn from the mistakes when with the when failure means death. And so that progression of, of both character development and RPG development is it, it seems a little less risky uh, in this particular case, but that's a smaller minor complaint to be honest. Um, still enjoyed the heck out of the, of the novel. So there you go. I had a good score of 7 out of 10. I had a good time reading it. That's going to be Shard Warrior, a lit RPG novel, Crystal Shards Online, book number two, with a score of 7 out of 10. There you go. On to our next review, which will be Alpha Test. Okay. Uh, this one is written by David Pendleton. It is 362 pages, $3.99. It is available on Kindle Limited. Um, I believe the actual, the, um, Amazon title on this is Alpha Testing Angor Angoramia Liturgy Adventure. So just be aware that there might be a slight mix there. Um, again, 362 pages, $3.99 available on Kindle Unlimited. Here is the author's description. The advertisement offered the ultimate virtual reality experience. Using a new technology known as Immersive Virtual Reality or IVR, you could truly experience the game as if you were in it. For someone who has been confined to a wheelchair all his life, the promise was impossible to ignore, but only a few would be invited to take part in the alpha test of the new game. Devin decided he would be one of those few. To ensure that he would be chosen, he took the most unlikely combination of skills specializing primarily as a craftsman and secondarily as a healer. The best race of for all of these skills is a gnome but that further weakens his ability to fight and survive. Still, it's only the alpha test, and once he's in, he can change it when he moves to the closed beta. What could possibly go wrong? Soon he finds out just how weak his choices seem to be uh, seem to the developers who figure he will die a lot and always be a nobody. Name chosen Nobody, uh, G-N-O-B-O-D-Y, uh, sets out to take on Angoramia, Angoramia, uh, and it is everything he could hope for until he becomes the only thing he may ever know. So there you go. Um, this is basically trapped in a game, slice of life story with an emphasis on crafting the first half of the novel. Um, in the second half of the novel, it shifts to a less interesting to me, at least story about the main character. Nobody, you know, get nobody you know, running from players looking to like collect a first kill bounty on him. And that's kind of a summary of the story without like, getting to spoil the details. Um, the story on the whole is very talky. Um, the author 
sent me a message earlier in the month saying, hey, here's my novel. It's coming out. I, I would love for you to check it out. And he said, but it's, 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 it's kind of this uh, talky story. And at the time I thought, oh, he's, he's exaggerating. Turns out he's not. <laughs> There's a lot of dialogue in the story, and there's a lot of um, inter- the dialogue between characters or internal dialogue, um, or just like summaries and stuff. Um, it's a lot. Like I estimated at least being um, 40% of the novel of some kind of dialogue or some kind of summary. Um, there's a lot of talking, and a lot of it is uh, happens in the beginning. Um, there's a really great opening in the story. I think it's 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 very nice. It hooks me in. It creates character empathy for the for the main character, um, makes me want him to succeed. And at the same time, I'm looking forward to like, what he can do. And all I mean, it gets, gets me hooked by the three percent mark on the story. But then the main character doesn't get into the game until like the twelve percent mark, and even then, he doesn't go full immersion until the twenty one percent mark. So all that space in between is basically a lot of talking. It's a lot of dialogue. Um, and while it's interesting speculative dialogue, there's a lot of cool thoughts, a lot of cool um, conversations. Very humorous stuff. If the humor lands for you, if you like puns and stuff, um, and a lot of like cool game descriptions of like what things are possible in the game, it's still a lot of talking, a lot of dialogue, and that may be a turnoff for some readers hoping for more action. Um, once in the game, the main character has a couple of neat fights, but again, um, the first half of the story is really focused on crafting, um, world building. Um, introduction to these storylines and what's possible with this particular combination of like a gnome, uh, a crafter and a healer. Um, and there's even a little romance that, you know, thrown in, which I thought was really cute. Even if it's a little forced, uh, introduction wise, it turns out very nice and very adorable. Um, it's, and it's really great if you like that stuff, not so much if you like action, if you, if you, if you just need action in your story, you know, and that's the thing you kind of go for. Um, the first half of this novel is, is just not going to work for you. Um, but for me, I like crafting. I like real building. This this was really satisfying to me. I would have liked more action. I would have loved it to be like spaced out a little more and the pacing to be a little bit different. But those were all just like things, you know, that I I you know I might like. But this is still a really good first half. I, I would give the first half on its own easily a score of seven out of ten. Then you get to the second half, uh, and the second half of the story definitely shifts focus. I feel like somewhere in like the beginning, reading, either the author decided or was told, "Hey, there's not enough fighting here," and there was like just a major shift towards combat. Um, and and like I said, the, the second half of the story is basically um, players are coming after the main character for first kill balance, which means as soon as they kill him, somebody gets paid in the world. world. Um, it's a whole like miniature contest thing it's basically a reason for um to force combat in the story um because other than that the main character would just continue crafting living his life maybe exploring some more doing some quests or some minor combat with some um moms and stuff uh, but the author decided to okay yeah he, he wants to force some more player versus player stuff and this is a way to do that it just doesn't feel natural and it feels a little forced but it's not like a, it's not like a huge force it makes sense contextual like oh players do this it just comes a little bit out of left field as far as the story goes, but it's not like horrible. Um, still the last half of the story is supposed to be combat focused. Only combat's not the highlight of this novel. Like the fights are okay. The fights are fine. There's, there's, there's a, a variety of enemies except that the main character very much is not a combat built. And so he has to figure out different ways of, um, supplementing his ability, so he's definitely a crafter. He he becomes like this gadgeteer, um, and this inventor, and so he can develop some cool things. But he can't tank by himself. He's not a solo fighter, and so uh, in one way or another, he has to um, supplement that. And that's kind of what he does. And that focus becomes less about him um, in combat decisions than other people. And it's something that will develop, and it, it makes logical sense. But again, the combat just isn't a highlight of the story. The fights are. They're functional. They're like descriptors like, oh, he decided to use this ability and they decided to use this one. Um, but they're not visceral. They're not the kind of fights that you like read and you just can imagine in your head and you like see like, oh, he sliced his leg and blood spurred and he cringed at you know the cut. That's not the kind of fight descriptions these are. These are these are very functional kind of fights. And again, not bad, just you know, not the highlight of the story. The highlight of the stories is is definitely crafting. It's definitely um the dialogue, the the punny humor, the interpersonal relationships, um, the world building, all that stuff is, is, is much better done, at least to me. Um, so the attempts to kill the main character with like this whole bounty thing, which again, doesn't really make sense to me, 
kind of felt like there were interruptions to what would otherwise would be like a fun slice of life story. Um, overall, again, I like the story, but it, that second half of the, of the novel just kind of dropped the best things um, I thought were going for it. It just kind of dropped them. I'm like, okay, that, that's a decision. It is what it is. Uh, just it dropped, also dropped my enjoyment of it a little bit. Uh, so I can't quite give it a 7 out of 10. Um, I'd give it a 6 out of 10 overall as a story. That's a score of like a 6 out of 10 again for Alpha Testing, Angramana, Liberty Adventure. Um, but again, still essentially a, a good crafting story in the first half. And again, plenty of good punny humor if it lands for you. If, if you like, if the jokes in this novel um, land for you, you're going to find a good time overall anyways. Um, but for me, again, it, it gets a score of 6 out of 10. So there you go. Not bad. Not boring at all. It's just couldn't quite make good because of the second half of that story. So there you go. Okay. On to our next review. Betrayal. <coughs> Sorry. Betrayal. A little bit of adventure, monsters, mazes, and magic. Book number two written by Terry W. Irving the second. Don't see many seconds. Uh, here we go. Um, it is $2.99. It is 273 pages. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. Glenn. A college sophomore hasn't gotten used to being a gnome healer, trapped on a role that functions under the rules of monsters, maces, and magic. Of course, acclimating isn't the plan. He, along with the other players, drawn into this RPG world in the form of their characters, want to escape and return home. Stephanie, Kirby, Ron, Derek, and Glenn survive their first adventure into the Dark Heart Swamp and are approached to once again enter their dismal, the dismal marshlands. An elf maiden, daughter of a baronet, has been taken captive by a band of goblins and gold is offered for her rescue. Gold is needed, not only if the party hopes to escape the game world, but to live and survive its perils. Glenn and his party take the mission even though they weren't the first choice. Beyond that, the foul swamp and its evil denizens may not be the greatest danger. A seer warns that their greatest threat lies in betrayal. So there you go. Okay. So, um... Overall, this novel essentially gets the same kind of review I gave book number one. Um, I tried book number one, didn't really quite land for me, um, and book two kind of falls in the same realm for much the same reasons. Um, when I read this series, I always kind of feel like I'm reading a fantasy story. No, I'm not saying it is. It is liturgy. There are um, plenty of game mechanic talk. There are even, in this particular uh, entry in the series, the characters actually get to see their character sheets in like, their dreams as they rank up, um, think level up. Um, but the reader doesn't. And that's kind of a perfect example of like how the author decided to incorporate the game mechanics in this series. Um, in the larger um, story world that these characters inhabit, the world is fantasy. It is. It, it's 100% fantasy. Um, it's only among like these characters, the, 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 these, 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 I think it's like five characters, um, that the game mechanics make sense. And it's almost like they're seeing this fantasy world through the lens of like what they know about this um, tabletop RPG game. And so all the game mechanics are just like them discussing things or them thinking about them. Like, oh, I know why I can't hit this monster. It's because my 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 rapier doesn't have enough dice roll. But as far as like the actual descriptions of the events, their interactions with other characters, it's it's all very fantasy. Um and that to me just kind of took away about it took away what I really like about Liturgy and the fact that those game mechanics aren't hidden away either from the reader or from the main characters. And I don't want to say that they're that's the case here, but it kind of feels that way because everything else about the story, everything about like the, the way the um all the other characters, all the other you know citizens of the world react, um, it's all very fantasy described. Um, the fights for the most part, fantasy described. There were just like these these passages or these like fairly regular ones. That's why I say it's a G, where the characters are either thinking of themselves or talking to each other about, oh, um, this is what the game mechanic is, and this is why this this is the case, and this is why this you know our elf maiden or elf you know teammate here is is stared at by her because she got a high roll. Um, but it's all amongst themselves, even when they talk to other other entities in the world, whether they're I want to say NPCs, but. Um, the game forces 
these characters to speak in fantasy terms and not use like these. They can't even actually say, um, even though the characters think know each other's names, the real names, um, whenever they say something, they actually use their fantasy character names. And it's it's literally forced by the game world or by the world, I guess. Um, so nobody ever goes like, oh, I, I want to purchase a plus one Vorpal Blade or I want to, you know, buy an AoE spell. Um, none of that occurs, unfortunately. And, and for me, it just makes it less interesting to me. Um, the actual story again, it, it, it's decent, um, very action adventure. If you liked book one, you like book two, um, they're, they're, they're good fights. Um, the story is it's heavily guided, like, like a DM session it would be where like the, the DM, um, tries to guide the players on a certain pathway so that his story can unfold. Um, and that's kind of what this feels like a lot of times. And it's not bad. It's just like, Oh, okay. That's, that's kind of what this feels like. Um, and a lot of the story just kind of feels like it's trying really hard to be a little bit G when it would probably flow more naturally just as a regular fantasy story. And that, and that's just my impression. Um, that's just kind of the vibe I get from it, but it just always stops you from like really liking the story a lot because it always feels like, Oh, I'm reading a fantasy story. And occasionally people talk about RPD mechanics, but they're not, they're not really part of the world as, 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 as much as I would love to see them be. And that's just what it is. Um, overall, again, not a bad story. If you like book one, you like book two, or if you just like lighter game mechanics, if you like lighter, lighter RPG mechanics, you're probably like this more than I did. And that's just, that's cool. Not everything is rent for everybody. So that's what it is. Um, this one just didn't land with me either. Again, not a bad story, not boring. Um, five is boring. Four is actually, I don't like it. Um, six is just like, oh, didn't work for me. Might work for you though. I just couldn't quite give it a seven, which is good. So there you go. Uh, get score six out of 10. Betrayal, a little pretty adventure of monsters, maces, and magic, book number two, with the score of six out of 10. So there you go. Okay, on to our last review. It's going to be A Gamer's Wish. Uh, it's a title of the Game Lit Series Hidden Wishes, book number one, um, by Tao Wong. So um, you might have read some of his other stuff um, A Healer's Gift. Um, something of the north i can't remember sorry uh system apocalypse i think it is but good you know good writer i've already enjoyed, enjoyed his stuff so i figured i'd give this one a try even though it does seem gamelet um a lot of times authors will just not use little bg for some reason or because of they have issues with copyright so they just don't think of it as as, as crunchy as maybe other readers might want it to be but this one is definitely still a little bit even though it says gamelet um it's about 250 pages that's an estimate uh, amazon doesn't currently have again a page count for this one it is three dollars 99 cents that is available on kindle unlimited here you go um now i will read you my description of the novel just because the author's one is super super short um henry is making a living purchasing goods at auction and reselling them. He buys an old briefcase and finds a genie inside that is willing to grant him three wishes. So what's the first thing he asks for? Like any good gamer, he asks for magical powers granted to him in an RPG leveling scheme. Um, now Henry has not only to learn how to use his powers, the quest for experience, while earning a living in this newly exposed urban fantasy setting. So there you go. That's my description of the story. And I think it is pretty good. Um, this novel is essentially urban fantasy uh, and lit RPG combined, which is kind of fun. Um, although it doesn't start out as urban fantasy at all, I was kind of surprised to see the shift. Uh, it, it happens um, a little bit into the story. Um, it, the beginning of the story starts off fairly normal. He's a, he's a guy. He's in his, I think, 20s. He's trying to just earn a living, you know, reselling products. He, he buys cheaply at auction, and he just happens to stumble along to the genie, and he grants her, and he, he gets a wish granted. Uh, the genie becomes a good part of the story. Uh, she kind of becomes a, uh, a DM in the story where she's kind of guiding his, his quest line experience, making sure the quests she gives him are level appropriate, granting him new powers and new abilities as he levels and gains experience. Um, but as soon as he gains his magic powers, he kind of sees the world different. It's like the veil has been lifted and can see all of the mythical and magical urban fantasy creatures that were just hiding there all along, which is very urban fantasy, you know, seeing the hidden world. Um, and so there is that new aspect to his, his world where he has to adjust not only to his new powers, but also to the fact that there are creatures of myth, the legend just hanging around living in his neighborhood and they've lived there longer than he is because he just didn't see them as like a human, as a, as a human, as like somebody without magical powers. Um, so it's, a, it's a very interesting combination of those two concepts, like, Oh, leveling up, increasing in power, but also dealing with these magical entities and kind of seeing how they're, um, developed and used in the story. It's kind of fun for me, at least. Um, 
the game mechanics in the story are pretty light, um, but they're consistent. They kind of consist of like mostly informational stuff. The main character's powers are, are gradually improved. He gets new spells, and his level of understanding of magical theory increases as his levels increases. And there's literally it says main character's name, level one, forty percent experience points, or as he continues on, eighty, ninety, then level two, all that good stuff. Um, but also lists like his spells that he's know he knows, and again he gets new spells or or improved versions of the spells he has currently as he levels. But also in the in the story, there are also things like um, notifications, damage notifications in the story, um, um, magical spell increases, like oh, increasing the, his infinity of the spells. All that's given to him is notifications from you know the genie's powers, basically. So there, there's a lot of like familiar RPG stuff that you're going to see in the story, which is why I'm like, oh, this is definitely little RPG, even though it says game light. I'm like, oh, it's a light RPG mechanics because it only applies to him and his. Um, increasing of his magical abilities like nobody else sees this stuff nobody else applies to the stuff um like he'll get information about oh estimating that monster you're fighting is like level four but nobody else none of the magical creatures none of the magic that other people have is associated for them with this rpg system it very much is for him like he's seeing all these things through the lens of the world and, and changing some rules so that it benefits him in like this very gamer kind of a way uh but for me super fun had a good time reading it um i liked again the supernatural elements and the magical urban fantasy stuff combined with the little bit story it was really it's kind of a neat change i i sort of read something similar to that so i'm like oh I, I was already kind of a into that kind of thing anyways so that's why i like it of course um it's a good overall just a good slice of life adventure and what do you mean my slice of life you've never heard that term um there's not really a plot here there isn't uh so don't expect one when you go into the story it's very much you follow this character going on his journey, going on adventures, going on quests, helping people, maybe, you know, not, not doing well at first or failing, um, his failures and his successes, all the stuff is there, but it's really just following him as he goes through his life, even though it's slightly fantastical and he's, there are RPG mechanics. Um, that's what slice of life is. Um, so don't expect like a big coherent plot. I don't think anything that the author's written, um, even though I'm fans of all this, all, all the series he's written, they're all slice of life. So you know, that's just kind of the writing he does. I think he writes a lot of this as serial stories online. So it's just things he puts out on a regular basis, then collects and puts out on Amazon. And that's fun. I mean, for me, I, I like that kind of stuff. It's, it's perfectly acceptable. I'm okay with these kind of stories, but not everybody is. Um, so be aware of what you're reading when you get there. Um, there are good fights in the story. The main character never feels overpowered and struggles with like each quest and challenge given to him. So he's, he's not an OP character, all good things that I enjoy. Um, and for me, I liked it. Gets a score of seven out of 10. That's a gamer's wish. A game lit up a D series, Hidden Wishes, book number one with the score of seven out of 10. So there you go. I enjoyed it. And that's it. We're done. Uh, thank you everybody for listening, for watching the show. And, uh, remember you can always follow the podcast at, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon. Well, I'll link to all those in the show notes. If you want to go check us out there. And of course you want to support the podcast in any way, shape or form, you can find out all the ways to do so at litrpgpodcast.com slash support. But again, thank you very much for listening. Hang out with me today, ladies and gentlemen. And until we can do so again, remember to go read some little RPG. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>